Well, hey, good morning. We're so glad that you're here and you joined with us today. We're going to worship the Lord in this place. Let's stand up to our feet and put our hands together as we begin.
sing us out, sure. This is my singing this morning church you can take a seat because we have a special uh thing coming up here in just a moment we have a baptism and someone is going to going to come forward and pro profess their faith for jesus and they want to do it here publicly before all of you so i encourage you as this baptism happens and when he comes up out of the water let's shout and let's scream and let's just be excited and we share in this joyful joyful time with him so we want to show you his testimony now take a look I'm Tom Clark. I've been uh, attending the church for a little over a year. 
I've uh, recently retired and have been uh, studying the Word more now. Back when I, I met my wife, say 40 years ago, she led me to Jesus at that time and uh, we were married, had a boy and a girl, raised her two children, uh, following God. Like everyone else, we run into hardships and struggles, adversities at times, and uh, you find yourself not understanding God's plan at times and started to depend more on myself, uh, kind of a, my self-determination to get me through where I should have been looking for help from above. In the past, I've, I, I attended church uh, uh, casually, not every weekend, with my wife who was a regular attender. And I had always told her that, uh, well, when I retire, I'll have more time to dedicate to God and the church. And I've reached that point and I wanna make that change. Through the study of the gospels, I've, I've, I feel a, more of a heartfelt sense of the word is coming through than it has before. I'd say it was definitely her and her praise and her singing daily, you know, you know, now that I'm home 24 hours with her, so it has affected me. <laughs> I want to be baptized today for the renewal of spirit, to praise the Lord and follow him more in the future. Well, church, will you stand as we sing one more song together, please?
And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born And the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of all Shall not kneel, it shall not fade By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who's resurrected me In second service coming up, we do have another baptism, and a young young boy is going to step forward, and we want to share his testimony with you now. Take a look. Uh, my name is Gavin. I have been going to Bedford Alliance my whole life, and I am nine years old. When I was growing up, I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, my parents have always told me about Jesus, and I have accepted him into my heart. When I accepted Jesus into my heart, I realized that I would go to heaven and live with Jesus. I want to be baptized because I want to show everybody that I have accepted Jesus into my heart. Well, good morning. I do want to welcome you to Bedford Lions Church. My name is Ryan. I'm the executive pastor. And as a, a staff, we've uh, been going through a book, and the title of the book is called Hitler's Cross. And really what the premise of the book is about is how when Nazi Germany came very strong upon the church, how much of the church folded. And he began to look at why did the church fold. Now, some stood strong, but much folded. And there was a quote in the book that I just want to share with you. It said this, Hitler learned that, quote, this is what he said, one cannot break the church over one's knee. It has to be left like a gangrenous limb. And what he began to do was divide a church. And he knew if he could divide the church, he'd have the church. After he divided it, he began to put pressure on it. But listen to the last part of the quote. But this was also what he said. But the healthy young belong to us. And he knew he could divide the church, but his desire was to get the young. Because if he had the young... He had the nation. You know, I was thinking we're going to be starting school soon. Some have already started. Some will be starting. But if we look at our world today, we know that Satan is trying to divide a church. And we know the world is coming strong against our young people. Right. And what we need to do is really pray for our young people. You know, there are people who are standing in the gap. If you're here and you work in the public schools or the private schools, you're a teacher, administrator, you drive a bus, whatever it is, can I ask a favor of you? Could you please stand right now? Because what we want to do is, want to, first of all, we want to pray for you. So if you wouldn't mind standing, we want to thank you because you're a light in a dark place. You hold back tides of evil. And if you're a young person, whether you're in elementary, junior high, high school, going off to the university, can I ask that you would stand? We as a church would like to spend just a few minutes just praying for all of you who are standing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, 
we know that we live in difficult times. Your scripture is very clear. It says, woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. Lord, we live in a time and a land where what is considered good in your eyes has become evil. And the things that we would consider evil are now promoted and considered good. And Lord, we realize that Satan is working hard to divide a church, but also to come against our young people. And Lord, I do want to lift up all those um, adults who are intervening, whether they're teachers, administrators, school bus drivers, whatever it is, God, you've called them to make a difference in a dark place. And Lord, your word says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God, I pray that in a very special way, I know that these teachers and administrators have a lot of tension on them right now with what's going on and trying to figure out how to maneuver these very difficult waters. God, I pray that you'd give them wisdom. I pray, Lord, that for those who are discouraged, that you'd lift them up. For those who are struggling with schedule issues, that you would work it through. But God, I pray that you'd be glorified and use them in a powerful way. And God, I want to pray for our young people. Lord, we recognize that Satan is coming hard against them. But I would pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your name, that you protect them. And Lord, not only would you protect them, but you would use them in a powerful way for you. Lord, I do think about Daniel, who lost his parents, was sent off to Babylon. But God, Daniel didn't just survive. He thrived. Because you were his anchor in his core. And God, I pray that when we look at this upcoming year with all the different trials and difficulties that are ahead of us, I pray that we would look back and say it was a great year because you were at work. And so God, I pray for your divine protection for on the, all those who are standing here, for those who are at home. But God, I just pray that you'd protect them in a very powerful way. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As a church, we do want to just thank you for your faithful giving. We're able to do the things we do because you are so faithful in your giving. Remember, there's three ways that you can give to the church. You can give online, you can give through the phone app, but also there's giving boxes in the back that you can give. I do want to draw your attention now to a couple announcements. In our community, hundreds of kids are living without a bed of their own. We're partnering with Let's Build to help change that. You can get involved by signing up to help make the beds. You don't need any building experience and all ages are welcome to participate. The build will take place on Saturday, September 12th at the house campus next door. Help get more kids off the floor and into their own beds. Sign up to help with the Let's Build project on our website or phone app. Two of the most painful life experiences include divorce and losing a loved one. If you've gone through either of these two situations, we invite you to attend Divorce Care or Grief Share. Both Divorce Care and Grief Share will help you find hope and healing during some of your most difficult days. You'll get to hear from experts on how to move forward with your life and find support from people who know what you're going through. Divorce Care and Grief Share will begin in September. We have two divorce care groups. Men will meet on Monday nights and women on Wednesday nights. Grief Share will meet on Friday nights. Don't try to go through these situations alone. Visit our website for more information and sign up to attend Divorce Care or Grief Share. I do want to let you know there are sermon notes available out in the foyer. Uh, As you come in, you can pick one up. If you need one, you can feel free to go out and get it at any time. And also on the back is some information regarding these different ministries that are available to you. Uh, Next week, we will be celebrating communion uh, together as a church family, and we will do it as we did before. The elements will be set up on a table out in the foyer, so when you come through, just please pick up your own element. That way, we're trying to practice uh, as much as possible the uh, uh, social distancing for you. Uh, Also, on October 25th, we are having uh, scheduled another baptism, people wanting to be baptized. So if you haven't been baptized, you'd like to take that step in obedience, uh, please contact uh, the church office, and we can set that up so we can plan your testimony or videotape your testimony. Unless you're under a rock someplace, you know that Hurricane Laura hit Louisiana. 
And I heard on the news that they estimate that a, a million people have lost power. A million people. You know, several years ago, in the middle of winter, we had a severe ice storm. And I remember our power was knocked out for a while as well. And, and in the short term, we had a little generator, and, and that worked out okay. But it went through a lot of gas, and <laughs> it only ran a few items at a time. And, and so it was okay, but in the long run, it wouldn't have lasted very long. And I confess to you that as I hear that on the news, I look back at that situation, that I, begin, I often take electric power for granted. If I go over and flip on a switch, I expect the lights to come on. If it's hot like it's been this last month and I go over and I adjust the thermostat, I expect the air conditioner to come on and keep me cool. In the winter, I go over and adjust the thermostat, I expect the furnace to kick on and keep me warm. You know, so when this ice storm hit, it gave me an attitude adjustment for the electric company. Many of you have had a similar experience. We just take these things for granted until they stop. Now, I've been a Christian now for almost 40 years, and I confess to you, sometimes I take the Holy Spirit for granted. And so today, I want us to consider making an attitude adjustment about the Holy Spirit. An attitude adjustment about the real power that's available to us. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and 15 and 16, we see there's answers to two simple questions. The two questions about the Holy Spirit. And the question number one is, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the simple answer is the Holy Spirit is God. In John chapter 14, verse 16, this is Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. In John chapter 15, verse 26, it says, Jesus again says, But when the Helper comes, who I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. In John chapter 16, verse 7, again, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. You see, the Holy Spirit is God, but Jesus specifically calls him the Helper. The Helper is the one designated by Jesus himself as an equal to himself. Folks, understand, the Holy Spirit is not some cosmic force. The Holy Spirit is God. And that is affirmed to us over and over again in the scriptures and in several different places. In Acts chapter 5, we see a dynamic ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, George MacDonald wrote that half of the misery in the world comes from trying to be what one is not. Isn't that true? It certainly was true with Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias, his name means God is gracious, but you know what he learned? He learned God is holy. Sapphira means beautiful, but we see that her heart was ugly with sin. In Acts chapter 5, what has happened is Barnabas had had some property, sold it, he gave all the money to the church, and we could just imagine how the people were affirming him and thanking him. And Ananias and Sapphira, they had some property. They didn't have to sell it. They chose to sell it. And once they sold it, they could do whatever they wanted with the money. They chose to keep some of the money for themselves, but to tell everybody that they gave it all to the church. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, it says, But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after, you, after it was sold, was it not in your, control, your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. And we know that God immediately struck Ananias down. Now, his wife wasn't there, but she had already agreed with her husband to do this. And a little bit later, she comes in in verse 9. It says, Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband. They're at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carried her out, and buried her by her husband. And I love verse 11. So great fear came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. I imagine it did. <laughs> they chose to lie to the Holy Spirit. It says they lied to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is spirit. Now the Lord is spirit. You see, this affirms the deity of the Holy Spirit. 
We know that the Holy Spirit was part of the creation of the universe. In Genesis 1-2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. In Job chapter 33, verse 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the, and the breath of Almighty gives me life. You see, 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, Now the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Holy Spirit created the world, created mankind, and what does he do? He also brings liberty. And the context here is talking about salvation to a repentant sinner. He brings liberty, salvation to a repentant sinner. In Mark chapter 3, in Mark chapter 3, verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the, forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. This blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. Now, in the context, what has happened, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, understand all the ministry that Jesus did when he was here on earth as a human being, all the, all the ministry was powered by the Holy Spirit that he did. And he, in the context, he had just healed a demon-possessed man. But what happened? We see the religious leaders, what they said here in verse 30, he said, he, referring to Jesus, has an unclean spirit. Understand what is happening here. The religious leaders were attributing the ministry that Jesus did to Satan, not to the Holy Spirit. And to attribute the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Today, it's, it's a defiant, hostile attitude against the saving power of Jesus Christ. It is a willful, persistent attitude of unbelief. I will not believe, I will not believe, I choose to ignore, reject what Jesus offers as a free gift. That is what it's talking about here. But it's a line that only God knows. You know, we look back in the Old Testament, and remember when Moses went and confronted Pharaoh, let my people go, and the Bible says, God hardened his heart. Or it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. But the fourth time it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Folks, we don't know where that line is. Only God knows where it is. But we do know that as long as a person is living, there is hope. And that's why we need to be praying for the scales to come off their eyes, the calluses off their heart, and that the Holy Spirit would allow the gospel to penetrate their heart and their mind, and they would come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, the unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, in John chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit. First of all, he called him a healer, but then he also used the pronoun he or him. Understand, the Holy Spirit is a person. He has three essential elements of personality. First of all, he has intellect. He has intellect. In Romans chapter 8, verse 27, it talks about the mind of the Spirit. The mind of the Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Holy Spirit has intellect. The Holy Spirit not only has intellect, but he also has emotions. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10 says, But they rebelled and they grieved his spirit. We understand a person can be grieved, and the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And the third element of a personality is will. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, in the context, it's talking about spiritual gifts. And so what he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Folks, all spiritual gifts are given by God the Holy Spirit who distributes, notice what it says, as he wills. And so when you and I complain or grumble that we don't like the gift we have or we want some other gift we don't have, understand we are complaining about God's choice. It is the Holy Spirit gives as he wills. Now, because the Holy Spirit is God, when you and I come to that point where we recognize we're sinners, we repent of that sin. Repentance, remember, biblical repentance is not only asking God to forgive us, but it's turning and going a different direction. 
It's no longer doing what our selfish desire wants, but we want to follow Jesus, be obedient to him. And when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, and we're saved. And when we do that, God the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. So who is the, what is the Holy Spirit? Is God in us. God in us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, if you don't have God, the Holy Spirit, living in you, you're not a Christian. You're not born again. Folks, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit does not have any weight or measurement. It has no size or shape. It has no color. It has no extension in space. But he exists as surely as we know electricity exists. And electricity uses power lines to distribute its power. But God, the Holy Spirit, uses Christians to distribute his power. You see, without the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, we would not be able to serve the Lord in this present world. Now, the scripture is pretty clear about what we're supposed to do. For example, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it tells us specifically, as Christians, we're to walk in the Spirit. We're to walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? It means a daily habit of continual obedience, doing whatever God told us to do. We're to walk in the Spirit. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, it says we're to worship in spirit. That word worship in original language means to render respectful spiritual service. We're to walk in the Spirit. We're to worship in the Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see that we're supposed to witness in the Spirit. To witness in the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit leads us to the right person. He gives us the right words to say that we could see the right results. You see, Christians can stand during the strong gale force winds of adversity, during hurricane-like struggles because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's God's gift to us. You see, the evidence of his presence is the fruit in our lives. Remember, we, we spent earlier this year, we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, self-control. You see, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is this fruit. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I watch the world news, I, it gets very depressing. I, I remember many years ago, uh, this news story was on about this, this couple that had retired. They were going to live out their dream. Their dream was to buy this big sailboat, Fill it full of Bibles. They're going to sail around the world, and every place they stopped, they were going to give away these Bibles. What a great dream, huh? Isn't it a great thing they'd be able to retire and have this kind of money to do this? And what happened? They were captured by pirates and killed. And my first thought was, why, God? Where were you? And we watch the news today and we see city after city after city protests turned violence, looting, burning, destruction. It seems like there's an all-out war on police officers. And, and I scratch my head and I wonder, where are you, God? And, and as I think this through, it brings me to the second question. What does the Holy Spirit do? Where are you? Why aren't you doing something? What do you do? Well, again, in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 8, it tells us specifically what the Holy Spirit does. It says that when he, talking about the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is one who convicts the world of sin. Now, it's important that we understand this word world. The world has three different uses in Scripture. It can be talking about the created world, the, the, the earth. In John chapter 1, verse 10, that's what it's talking about, the, this, this physical planet that we live on. It can use, the word can be used for humanity. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, talking about human beings. Or it can refer to those who oppose God, as it does in John chapter 15, verse 18, and John chapter 16, verse 8. You see, we sometimes use this phrase, the world system, to define a special meaning. For example, it's not uncommon to hear something like this on the radio or the TV. And now from the world of sports. Now when we hear that, we know it's not some special country or some special planet where everyone lives who is connected in some way to sports. The world of sports refers to all organizations, people, plans, activities, and philosophies that are part of the sports. You see, some of these things are visible, but some are not. But all are, are organized around one thing, sports. 
You see, the world, from a Christian point of view, involves all the people, plans, organizations, activities, philosophies, and values that belong to a society without God. Now, some of these things may be very cultural. Some may be very corrupt. But all have their origins in the heart and mind of a sinful man and and promote what sinful man wants to enjoy and accomplish. You see, as Christians, we must be careful not to love the world. Remember 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world? Do not love the world or the things in the world? In in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it it tells us not to conform to the world, but we're to be transformed. How? Transformed by the renewing of our minds as we read God's word and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. We're to be transformed. See, Jesus pulled no punches when he tells us Uh, tells his disciples that the situation in the world will be very, very serious and dangerous, even deadly. I want you to notice the progression of the world's opposition to disciples and to us as Christians. In John chapter 15, starting in verse 18 and 19, it says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. What do we have to look forward to as Christians? The world is going to hate us. Verse 20. Remember the, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours as well. What do we have to look forward to as Christians? Persecution. He goes on verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. He's talking about excommunication and even death. So as Christians, what do we have to look forward to in this world? Being hated, being persecuted, being excommunicated, and even some put to death. Now that's real encouraging, isn't it? No amens on that one. (laughs) See, you can... You can trace these stages of resistance as you read the book of Acts. The key to the Holy Spirit's ministry is that one word, convict. Convict. Convict is a legal term that means to pronounce judgment. You see, the Holy Spirit does not merely accuse men. He brings an inescapable sense of guilt so that they realize their shame and helplessness before God. Now today we often talk about brokenness, but but honestly, if you've ever experienced this, There's not really an adequate word to describe it. You just know, you know that brokenness, that hurt, that that remorse that you feel inside. And this conviction applies to three particular areas. Again, John 16, 80 says, convict the world of sin. You see, sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is the prosecuting attorney who presents God's case against humanity. And folks, please understand this simple truth. As the prosecuting attorney, he never, 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 never loses a case. He never loses a case. He creates an inescapable awareness of sin so that it cannot be dismissed but with an excuse. You know, so many today want to say, well, I didn't know any better. Listen, all human, born, all human beings are born with a conscience. Now, yes, it is true, according to 1 Timothy 4, 2, that our conscience can be seared, but we are born with a conscience, and that conscience inside tells us there's something greater than we are, and that something is God. People today want to use the excuse, well, everyone else is doing it. Remember back in the Old Testament with King David? You see, back in those times, it was very common for kings to have many, many wives and concubines. Anything, any female they wanted, they just took. And remember, David took Bathsheba, and when she became pregnant, he had her husband killed. And he thought he got away with it. Nobody would know, right? He's the king. Who's going to say anything? But God knew. Remember, God sends Nathan, the prophet, to confront David, the king. And Nathan uses this great story about a man with many, many sheep and a man, a poor man with just one poor lamb. And how the rich man took the the poor man's lamb. And David was infuriated. He couldn't believe it. And Nathan, the prophet, said, you're the man, David. And when that happened, I believe God the Holy Spirit brought such conviction on David. We know that because he wrote in in Psalm how much, how he felt. In Psalm 51, verse 4, he said, against you, talking to the Lord, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Conviction by the Holy Spirit. 
You see, the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin. And notice what it says here in verse 9. In John chapter 16, verse 9. Of sin because they do not believe in me. You see, the word sin here is not a general sense. It's not a casual indifference or opinion, but specifically unbelief in Jesus Christ. It's total rejection of God's message and God's messenger. You see, a human court can convict a man of murder, but only the Holy Spirit can convict a man of unbelief. In Matthew chapter 12, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32, it says, Jesus speaking said, Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Again, talking about blasphemy, the unpardonable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You see, someone never exposed to Christ's divine power and presence might reject him in ignorance and forgiveness, assuming, assuming unbelief gives way to genuine repentance. We see that in the life of the Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus. He could be forgiven for speaking against the Son of Man and persecuting his followers because Saul's unbelief stemmed from ignorance. And we know that later, after he was saved, he was transformed to the Apostle Paul and a great leader in the church. In 1 Timothy 1.13, it says, admitted to being a blasphemer. Those are what Paul was saying. I recognize this is what I did. This was wrong. But God in his grace forgave me. You see, it is those who know Jesus Christ's claims are true and reject him anyway that sin against the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit makes Christ known to us. To reject this truth is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. No forgiveness was possible for the Pharisees who witnessed Jesus' miracles. They stood there. They saw the miracle. They saw the healing. And then they claimed it was the work of Satan. See, today, many do not want to believe in judgment. Why? Remember last week? Beliefs determine what? Oh, you're letting me down. Thank you. The beliefs determine behavior. Beliefs determine our behavior. So too many today do not want to believe in judgment. We, we want to believe that we can do whatever we wish with no consequences. And sometimes we're encouraged by this as, because we look at it and it doesn't seem like God judges immediately. At least not like he did with Adam, Ananias, and Sapphira. And, and we look and it, it seems that God allows these sins to go unpunished. Remember, it was Dr. Billy Graham who said, if God doesn't punish America, he's going to owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And so we look at this, and, and, and we see it's true. God often does not visit his judgments on a sinner immediately. That doesn't happen. Evil often seems to go unpunished. Why? Because our God is long-suffering. And I am so thankful he is, because if he'd have punished me like I deserved, I would not have known Jesus as Lord and Savior. There are people all around us who are facing a Christless eternity, eternity suffering in hell, and it's our job, our responsibility, our privilege to share the gospel with them. And how do we do it? First, we're praying for them that the scales will be removed from their eyes, the calluses from their heart, and then that God, the Holy Spirit, would lead us to say the right words at the right time to the right person to see them come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Our God is long-suffering, but make no mistake about it. His judgment is coming. And Peter makes that same point concerning false teachers, showing that God judged the fallen angels. God judged the world at Noah's time. God judged the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In 2 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. For the day of judgment. For three years, Jesus had been there to protect the disciples from attack. He's preparing them. He's going to leave now. And so the Holy Spirit is going to come and empower the church. The Holy Spirit does not minister in a vacuum. Just as God the Son had to have a body in order to do his work, so the Holy Spirit needs a body. And you know what that body is? The body is the church. It's you and me. It's you and me. We are the body of the Holy Spirit. And John, again, back in John chapter 16, in verse 8 and verse 10, it says, And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness. 
verse 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you'll see me no more. The word righteousness here is God's absolute standard. All thought and action must be compared to God's absolute standard. You see, most people want to compare themselves with someone who doesn't even measure up to our level. For example, as a husband, I might want to compare myself with someone who is a wife beater. And I look at him, and I, then I can tell him my wife. I can strut around like a banding rooster, you know. Hey, honey, look how good you are. You got me as a husband, right? You see, if I compare myself to him, I'm really good, man. You got a real catch there, babe. <laughs> but I can't do that. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to compare myself to Jesus. What did Jesus say? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. You know, when I look at that comparison, I think, what a slug in a ditch I am. I miss the mark. God, forgive me. Help me to be that kind of loving husband. You see how we do that? We want to compare ourselves with someone who makes us look good, but God says we're supposed to compare ourselves to his absolute standard. You see, there must be an awareness of the holiness of God before a person realizes his or her own deficiency. Those who believe the Spirit's testimony about their sinfulness and Christ's righteousness and respond in genuine faith are instantly closed with God's righteousness. That's what the Word tells us. Well, he says here, and when he comes, he, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. In verse 11, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You see, judgment always occurs when an act or thought is evaluated by an absolute standard. And the judgment here in the context is that the world is under Satan's control. Understand, its judgments are blind and faulty and evil as evidence of the verdict of Jesus Christ. The world cannot make righteous judgment, but the Holy Spirit can and does. All Satan's claims are lies so that the Spirit convicts men of their false judgment of Christ. You see, Satan, the ruler of this world, the God of this age, has perverted and turned people away from Jesus Christ. What do we see in our world today? What God says is good, the world calls evil. What, what, we, what God says is evil, the world calls good. That's the world we live in today. And we look back and, and we see that Christ's death looked like Satan's greatest victory. But in reality, it was Satan's destruction. You see, as Christians, our, body, our, our bodies are tools of the Holy Spirit. We are a temple of God. We're supposed to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't float around in some ghostly way like Casper the Friendly Ghost. See, that's what many people have this perception that the Holy Spirit just kind of floats around here, goes wherever he wants. The Holy Spirit works through people in whom he lives. He works through born-again believers of Jesus Christ. Now, do you realize that the privilege and the importance of praying for someone in need, praying for our international workers... You see, sharing how Jesus has changed your life is another way the Holy Spirit works in you. When you share your story, your testimony, like we saw this morning with the baptism, how Jesus Christ has changed your life, it's a powerful tool that God gives to you. And as we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, what's he do? He leads us to people who need to hear our story, how Jesus Christ changed our life. And that's what he wants us to do. Well, we also see the Holy Spirit's ministry to the disciples. Look what it says here in John 16, verse 12 and 13. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. You see, Jesus always gave the right amount of truth at the right time. You know, that is the mark of a great teacher, isn't it? They give the right amount of truth at the right time. The Holy Spirit uses the same principle. He teaches us truth when we need to know it and when we're ready to receive it. That's why it's important that we keep reading and rereading God's word because as we grow and we change, the Holy Spirit illuminates things to our hearts and our minds that we, we've read before, but we didn't understand it because we weren't ready to receive it. Notice he says he will guide you in all truth. The result is that the disciples wrote the epistles. And he says, tell you things to come. They wrote the prophetic scriptures. The disciples wrote the epistles and the prophetic scriptures. We know Matthew 24 and 25, Mark chapter 13, Romans chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 15, but especially the book of Revelation are about things to come. Well, the third aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we see here in verses 14 and 15, he will glorify me 
for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. You see, the chief purpose is to not to glorify himself. The chief purpose is to glorify Jesus Christ. The chief purpose is to make God a reality to people. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He glorifies Jesus Christ and makes God a reality to people. We look around at the world events today and we can be scared, we can be depressed, we can be feeling overwhelmed. What are we going to do? But realize this, the Holy Spirit is at work now, but he never, never, never forces any believer to do what the believer does not want to do. If you don't want to walk in obedience, don't worry. He's not going to make you. But he will help you if you choose, say, Lord, this is what I desire. This is what I want. You see, the Spirit is willing and waiting to fill any and all who desire to be filled and used by him. But he will never, never force himself on us. As each of us surrenders to Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and use us, we often don't see the results. But God does. And understand this. God will hold each and every one of us accountable. In the book, Finding Your Way, Gary LaFerla tells about an amazing story taken from the U.S. Naval Institute following World War II. The USS Astoria engaged the Japanese during the Battle of Salvo Islands before any other naval ships could arrive. And during a crucial battle at night, August 8, 1942, the Astoria scored several direct hits on the Japanese vessel, but it received a lot of damage itself. In fact, it ended up sinking the next day. But here's how the story unfolded. At about 200 hours, a young Midwestern signalman, third-class Staples, was swept overboard by the blast when the Astoria's number one eight-inch gun exploded. Wounded on both legs by shrapnel and semi in shock, he was kept afloat by a narrow life belt that he managed to activate a simple trigger mechanism. Around 600 hours, Staple was rescued by a passing destroyer and returned to the Astoria, whose captain was attempting to save the cruiser by beaching her. But the effort failed, and Staple, still wearing that same life belt, found himself back in the water. It was about lunchtime, picked up again, this time by the USS President Jackson. He was one of 500 survivors in a battle who were evacuated. On board of the transport, Staples, hugging that life belt with gratitude, looked at the small piece of equipment for the first time. He scrutinized every stitch of the light belt that had served him so well. It had been manufactured by Firestone Tire and Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio, and it bore a registration number that, that he memorized. Given home lead, Staples told his story and asked his mother, who worked at the Firestone plant, about the purpose of the number on the belt. She told him that the company insisted on personal responsibility for war effort and that the number was unique and assigned to only one inspector. Staple remember everything about the life belt, and he quoted the number. And there was a moment of stunned silence in the room. The mother finally spoke up and said, that was my personal code that I fixed to every item that I was responsible for approving. We can only imagine the emotions when the hearts of a mother and a son as they pondered the, her responsibility so many years ago and the impact it had upon her son. You see, the threads had come together in an inescapable way. The one who gave him birth and whose DNA he bore gave him rescue in a swirling waters threatening to take his life. Now, if an earthly parent playing the role of procreations can provide a means of rescue without knowing when and for whom that belt would come into play, how much more, how much more can our God of all creation accomplish? How much more? By his sovereign will, we have come into being with an expressed and designed purpose. To be able to accept the wonder and the marvel of one's own personality, however flawed we may be, however accidental, and place it in trust the hands of one who made us is one of the greatest achievements in life. Folks, understand God's registration number is on you and me. It's on each and every one of us. Your DNA matters because the essence of who you are matters. And who you are by design matters. Every little feature, every little a little flaw of your personality, your, your struggles, it matters. Consider it God's sovereign imprint on you. 
You know, there's an old hymn that I'd like to use as a closing prayer. Please listen closely. I want to read it. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to use this as a closing prayer. And if you don't agree, I'm just going to ask you to just say out loud, yes, Lord, yes. Holy Ghost with light divine, shine upon this heart of mine. Holy Ghost with power divine, cleanse this guilty heart of mine. Holy Spirit all divine, dwell within this heart of mine. Cast down every idle throne, reign supreme, and reign alone. If you're able, would you please stand with me for prayer? And understand, I'm going to read this again. And if this is your desire, just say, yes, Lord Jesus, yes. Holy Ghost with light divine, shine upon this heart of mine. Holy Ghost with power divine, cleanse this guilty heart of mine. Holy Spirit all divine, dwell within this heart of mine. Cast down every idle throne. Reign supreme and reign alone. And if you agree, just say, yes, Lord Jesus, yes. Christ is my reward, is all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that can ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul.
Thank you for joining with us today. Have a great week. God bless.